Hi, uh, I'm Daniel Ingber. I'm the uh, VP for Government and Legal Affairs for SEMA. And uh, I have uh, Leslie Stout to backman with me, and we're excited to present this presentation on COVID-19 impact on small businesses, understanding the new leave requirements. Um, this is an hour-long webinar. Uh, I just want to go through some quick technical housekeeping. Um, uh, you may be joining the presentation using your computer speaker by default. If you want to join by telephone, you can uh, select the telephone and the audio pane and you dial in information will be presented. You also be able to submit uh, questions today using the text box on the side that says questions. You can send your questions at any time and we'll collect these questions and I'll recite them orally during, uh, during Q&A at the end. We hope to have about 10 minutes for questions at the end. We're going to have a copy of the PowerPoint that you can access um, at some point. We're going to upload that. Um, and then for those who are accessing this um, after the webinar, I, it's really important to note that this information is current as of today. Um, and uh, we're, th this is a changing very quickly. So on Wednesday, April 8th, this is, they're gonna, this is current, but uh, new regulations are being implemented, new interpretations are being implemented, and new laws are being passed. So just wanted people to be mindful uh, of that. So um, uh, first, I want to um, point everyone to the SEMA website, www.sema.org slash coronavirus, where we have a lot of resources involving uh, uh coronavirus including the uh ppp loans sba loans uh information regarding um the uh uh department of labor issues that we're discussing today and other information and resources so um i want to um first i'll want to introduce leslie who's a, a partner at jackson lewis um, she's been doing uh, employment law for a long time, specializing in wage and hour law, but also everything the FLSA and uh, service contracts, everything, um, and also just general employment advising. Uh, she's a real expert on this and a real expert on these issues that are coming ahead. I'm going to turn it over to Leslie in a second, but um, I just wanted to express to, to our SEMA members that we understand how difficult of a time this is. Everyone is trying to figure out if they can continue to do business, whether they define as an essential business mm -hmm. under their state law or the federal law. Uh, they're trying to figure out uh, if they can make payroll if they're not doing business um, and, 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 and what kind of resources are available from the federal government and others to help assist them with payroll. And if they can't, what kind of obligations do they have with regarding unemployment and regarding paid leave, regarding everything else? Um, this is a, uh, SEMA's here as a resource to help through, through these issues. And we're, uh, we're confident that we're gonna get through what's difficult time, that this industry is gonna remain strong and we're all gonna enjoy a, a great SEMA show in November. So with that, I'm going to leave it. I'm going to turn it over to Leslie, and uh, she can begin. All right. Thank you, Daniel. Um, just echoing some of those words um, for those who are listening in or may listen in later to the recorded session. Um, we feel your pain in this. Um, it has been a such a very very difficult time um, for all employers, um, and certainly smaller employers are getting hit just particularly hard because they are typically much more, you know. Smaller workforces, more dependent on their workforces, um, leaner with in terms of income stream, and yet you still have your um, your payouts for you know rent and and payroll and healthcare and all of that. So truly difficult times. Um, a lot of what we're going to be talking about today is supposed to help you as a smaller employer um, navigate through the financial. Uh, burdens that have been caused by this really absolutely unprecedented um, pandemic and the impact that it's having on businesses. Um, however, um, you know, as we go through it, there's there's a lot of good in it. Um, there are some, you know, strings attached sometimes to what you as an employer are going to need to do to take advantage of it. And there is a lot of um, a lot of issues that are actually unclear at this time. And I'll certainly try to you know point out where we see a lack of clarity right now and what we might see coming down the pike you know what why is that you know honestly the federal government state governments local governments are scrambling um, like a lot of us like a lot of businesses um, our law firm is a business so you know we have calls and talks about this um, internally as well as advising our clients 
Um, the result is, though, that some of the legislation, some of the regulations, some of the guidance that's coming out has been really cobbled together really quickly. Um, and that leaves us with some gaps, some contradictions, some holes. And so we keep kind of waiting to see, well, you know, is it going to be corrected? Is it going to be clarified? So the caveat that Daniel said right up front, I just want to repeat again, a lot of this is still fluid. Um, and so what we say today is out in the Department of Labor regulations or the guidance that's been issued, you know, may change tomorrow or a week from now. So you do definitely want to, you know, just keep on top of this, keep posted. So um, we're going to talk today about um, obligations and benefits under Family First Coronavirus Relief Act, otherwise known as FFCRA. There's been a huge unemployment benefits expansion under Phase 3 of the Congressional Relief. Um, the acronym for that is CARES. And then we also want to talk about some key labor and employment laws kind of implicated in this pandemic. So while you as small business employers are making often very difficult decisions about um, who you can keep on your workforce and who may be entitled to leave and um, furloughs versus layoffs, reduced hours and such. Um, we just want to highlight for you some of the laws that you need to be thinking about as you're making the, those decisions. And then finally, um, talk a little bit about some practical issues and communications with employees. Okay, next slide. Great. And actually, you can go to the next one. Thanks. So this Family First Coronavirus Response Act, um, this was signed into law um, March 18th, 2020, um, a fairly rare uh, example of both sides of the aisle in Congress coming together along with the president to try to you know, get a lot of funds out to employers and to employees as quickly as possible. And this really has two key provisions for employers. It creates limited paid sick leave and also amends the Family Medical Leave Act, which most employers are pretty familiar with. Um, depending on the size, you may or may not be covered by it. F FMLA, I'll just point out, is both a federal law and then there are many, many um, local jurisdictions and states that have mini versions of FMLA. So you may or may not right now be covered by federal FMLA or state or local FMLA, but you'll want to pay attention even if you've never been covered before because this is an expansion and the coverage is different. The, the benefits and requirements um, under Families First became effective April 1, 2020, and it's temporary. It only runs through the end of the year, December 31, 2020. The U.S. Department of Labor, so Congress passed this legislation, it was signed into law, but the U.S. Department of Labor is a key federal agency that is going to be both, um, and they have actually just issued temporary regulations um, on April 1. They were just published early this week, actually. Um, they are the ones that are covering this new paid leave and expanded FMLA. They've also been publishing guidance um, and updated FAQs. Those are available on the DOL website. And we definitely encourage you, you know, I, I'm trying to look at them every day. When I mentioned before that, you know, things are changing, um, every time we look at the FAQs, not every time, but they've been updated maybe six or seven times, adding new questions and answers. But also, and importantly, one day we might look and the answer to one question is yes. Well, during the update, they've gone back and revised that same question and came out with no for the answer. So, you know, we're kind of scrambling. Um, it's definitely not easy to come up with. The regulations that have been issued are temporary regulations. Um, we think that they might um, come out again with some perhaps revised version because already key members of Congress that were involved in writing the legislation of se itself sent a letter to the Department of Labor, Labor saying, hey, you've got some of this wrong. We don't like your regulations. We don't like some of your FAQs. That's not what we meant. We want you to revise it. So again, um, you know, we're all sort of on the lookout for what, what might be coming next. Okay, slide. 
So let's start with um, under this particular law um, with the new regs, what is a covered employer? So it's definitely meant for smaller businesses, private employers with fewer than 500 employees, and you count your employees at the time that the leave is requested. So honestly, you know, right before this was passed and before this pandemic occurred, maybe you had more than 500 employees and then you've had to furlough, um, lay people off. Um, maybe people quit because they were worried about their health and safety and now you have fewer than 500. So it's at any point in time when an employee may request either of these leaves, you gotta do a head count. And some of you on this call may be so not close to this that you're not gonna have to keep counting every time, but anyone who's just under, just over 500 is gonna have to pay attention to that. There's also certain public employers that are covered. And then very importantly for some of you folks that may be listening to this, there are certain exemptions for employers, small businesses with fewer than 50 employees. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. Slide. So we've put up here in a chart rather than what do we have before? 10 slides, and we, we've tried to consolidate well, it together for you to you know, take a look at. Preview of everything so that you guys could see these programs before she goes into it in more detail. Yeah. yeah. Um, but this really lays, again, kind of side by side what these new um, leave requirements are. So if we take a look at the employer coverage, they're, they're basically the same, um, less than 500 employees. Now we say, okay, but what employees are covered? Is there any waiting period? Is there, do they have to have been here, you know, employed by a certain date? On that one, for emergency paid sick leave, no, no. Any employee without any kind of waiting time, um, if they qualify for the reasons that we'll talk about in a moment, is eligible for paid sick leave. There is no wait time. For the emergency FMLA, someone has to be employed at least 30 days. So that is a very short time period compared to the qualifying time period under federal FMLA and a lot of state laws, right? So again, for those of you that have never had to deal with this kind of paid leave, this kind of FMLA, you are likely going to be covered. Um, the reasons, there are six reasons we'll talk about in a moment to get and to qualify for emergency paid leave. There's only one for the expanded FMLA leave. How much time do they get? And is it paid or unpaid? Under emergency paid sick leave, the cap on it, but your employees could get up to 80 hours. So we say kind of two weeks if that's a 40 hour schedule, but it could be 80 hours if it's spread out, you know, depending on, on the schedule that folks work. So I'd keep an eye on, you know, the 80 hours, not two weeks in time. For the emergency um, FEMLA, it's 12 weeks and 10 weeks of that are paid. So the first two weeks can be unpaid, although we'll talk in a moment about if you have other paid leave requirements by law or by policy you provide paid leave, it may end up that these folks are getting paid. But the law itself says of those 12 weeks, presumably two weeks could be unpaid and then the other 10 weeks are going to be paid. How much do they get? So what do you have to pay your employees? Under the emergency paid leave, it's their regular rate, um, and that is defined currently by the Department of Labor um, just the way it is under the Fair Labor Standards Act. So it basically means, you know, if you looked at um, a week and said, this is how many hours they worked. I'm going to divide it by the compensation of the wages that were provided. You do get to pull out overtime pay. Um, you'll come up with the regular rate. Depending on the qualifying reason, we'll talk about this on the next slide, it could be their full regular rate or two thirds of their regular rate. And that's going to be if they're caring for a child because of um, schools or a child, a daycare or child care provider being closed. But there is a cap on that, right? So whatever that person's rate is, and of course it has to meet minimum wage, right? So you can't dip below that. The cap per day though is $511 for basically as we get into the reasons, taking a reason for yourself because you're sick or a $200 cap as we look at the reasons in a moment if you're basically can't be working because you have a child at home um, who has had daycare or school closed. So 
those caps apply whether it's for um, you're paying at that regular rate or the two thirds rate, we always have those caps on how much pay. The aggregate, so that means, okay, when we look at the whole 80 hours that someone could take and you'd have to pay them under emergency paid leave, it's no more than $5,110 if they're taking leave for themselves or the cap of $2,000 if they're doing it for one of those childcare reasons. And when we compare that to the emergency FMLA, um, the one reason is only for uh, having to be at home to care for children because their daycare schools are closed. And so that is being paid at two thirds of your employee's regular rate. So you don't have to pay the full amount. Um, the cap on that then is $200 per day and the total cap is $10,000. There's, there's some, you know, kind of in the weeds a little bit that have come out with the Department of Labor, again, temporary regulations about, you know, more detail about how do you calculate um, the regular rate. What the Department of Labor was concerned about is trying to get an average. So if you had somebody working a lot of hours one week, not many hours the next week, and they're taking this paid leave, what are you supposed to do? And I'll say just kind of at a high level, they are saying that you should average six months of pay. If the employee has been there six months, a shorter time period if they haven't been with you that long, and take a look. And literally, it's going to be how many hours did they work during that six-month period? How much did you pay them, excluding overtime premium pay? And there's a couple of other exclusions under the FLSA. And that's going to yield you an hourly rate, like an average hourly rate, that's what you're going to need to pay them when they take this emergency paid leave. And the FMLA leave works pretty similarly. Okay, next slide. So um, let's talk about the reasons. Um, so the regular rate, and we're going to kind of do it by how much do you have to pay them. The paid sick leave is going to be that sort of full regular rate that we talked about with that 511 per day cap. When someone takes paid sick leave and the employee is subject to a quarantine or isolation order related to COVID-19, they've been advised by healthcare provider to self-quarantine due to concerns related to COVID-19 or they're experiencing symptoms of COVID-19 seeking a medical diagnosis. So, that basically means it's kind of, it's about the individual employee, him or herself, right? They've been diagnosed with COVID-19. They're experiencing symptoms of COVID-19. They've been told you need to get it, uh, or they've on their own sought a medical diagnosis because they've got symptoms of COVID-19. That seems to expand a lot. So, you know, fever, dry cough, um, chest tightness, but now we're hearing about, abdom you know, um, abdominal symptoms as well. Um, so, you know, it could be a fairly wide range why someone says it's possible I may have COVID-19 and I need to go get a medical diagnosis. Often people are being tested um, and it may take a week, it may take longer than a week to get a test result, a positive test or a negative test. Often people can't be tested yet. Um, this is wildly depends on what state or jurisdiction you're in and what kind of employee you might have. So certainly what we can see this being used for as well, as someone has gone to the doctor's office, the doctor has said, you know, either I am giving you a test, but we won't know, I need you to stay at home, self-quarantine, or you're not even eligible for a test, but gee, it seems like you may have COVID-19, so I'm telling you that you need to you know, you're being advised to self-quarantine. So you're gonna be looking for really a fairly broad range and um, some reliance, you can ask for, you know, some certification on this, but frankly, what we're hearing is a lot of doctors are even too busy. Um, so you may or may not even get real certification um, as to the reason someone is taking this paid sick leave. So that's at the regular rate that we talked about or this cap of 511 per day. 
So when do you have to pay the two thirds of regular rate or the 200 per day cap? For paid sick leave, if that's being requested when the employee is caring for an individual who needs to quarantine, isolate, or self-quarantine, right? So it could be um, a family member, a close relative, um, but it's not about them, it's about someone else who may be sick, or the employee is experiencing any other substantially similar conditions specified by the Secretary of Health. Um, that hasn't happened yet. So if someone says to you, I've got a substantially similar condition right now, you can be like, no, because none have been declared, but that's something that we'll wanna keep an eye on. You can also qualify to get that two thirds of a regular rate if the employee is caring for the employee's son or daughter, right? So that is only son or daughter. That's not a grandchild. It's not a nephew. It's not your, your mother-in-law. It's caring for the employee's son or daughter. Can be stepson or stepdaughter though, because the child's elementary or secondary school or place of care, could be an individual daycare provider or a place of care has been closed or the child care provider, maybe it was someone coming to the home, is now unavailable, all for reasons related to COVID-19. So your employee could request either and or together paid sick leave or this emergency FMLA under these conditions, right? Because it's the child's daycare um, is no longer available or their school is closed. It's unclear right now um, whether the many uh, stay at home orders or shelter in place orders that sometimes we think we're quarantining, but it's not a real quarantine because no healthcare provider and no government has ordered that we quarantine under penalty of law. Um, the Department of Labor regs right now suggest that stay at home or shelter in place orders themselves would not trigger this paid leave. And we'll talk about in a few minutes that those kinds of things may well trigger the availability of unemployment benefits. However, this is one of those issues that certain Congress people have written into the Department of Labor saying, no, we think it should be expanded, that people might be able to get this kind of paid leave under certain stay at home or shelter in place orders. Also, um, the Department of Labor right now has written its regs that says, look, if you as an employer have had to just close your business, either in whole or in part, and lay off or furlough employees, then no, you know, they're not entitled to these types of leave because there's no work for them to do. And this type of leave is really meant for, no, your business is still open. This employee would still be working, but for the reasons to take leave. However, that's another area um, that Congress has written to the Department of Labor saying that they're not all that happy with the interpretation right now of the law. So we do need to stay tuned for, you know, is there going to be any, you know, clarification or cleanup that might expand those rights? Um, I'll just say as a place marker, I think what the Congress folks are concerned about is that employers are just going to kind of, you know, willy nilly start laying off and furloughing people to avoid having to provide the paid leave. We think that the answer is, that's doubtful that's gonna happen. Employers that we talk to are trying to stay open. They're trying to do the best for their employees. And by the way, if they have to close, yeah, they're not gonna get this paid leave, but they're going to get, which we'll talk about in a moment, very generous federally funded unemployment benefits. But those are the things that are a little bit up in the air right now that we just wanna say, look, you know, pay particular attention because that could be changing. Next slide. So there is a potential exemption, or really it's a partial exemption for small businesses with fewer than 50 employees. When the provision of either the paid leave, um, well, actually it's, it's only this one type of leave um, that I have on the slide below, but when it's gonna jeopardize the viability of the business as a going concern. So those are all sort of legally buzzwords. But the way that the regs read now is, a small business employer, again, less than 50 employees at the time any of this leave is requested, will be, can be exempt from providing the paid leave due to that school or place of childcare closure 
or that the child care provider is unavailable because of COVID-19 related reasons, or if they're trying to seek this expanded FMLA leave due to school or place of care closures. Um, you could be exempted when doing so is really gonna jeopardize your business. Um, let's go to the next slide. We'll talk a little bit more on what that means. But importantly, take a look. This is only for any leave that's related to the school closed, childcare isn't available. There is no exemption for small employers, you know, really small employers for the paid sick leave portion that doesn't, that has to do with caring for self or caring for a family member who may, you know, have symptoms. So, you know, a lot of people thought at first, like, oh, it's all exempt. Sorry, Daniel. Also for the family medical leave portions that are not related to uh, school closures, right? Those those are also no exemptions. Right, for but but the but the expanded family medical leave is actually only expanded for that very narrow school closure and child care provider, gotcha. right? But it's confusing because for employers who are covered by other FMLA, right, they've got to look and say, well, does that you know does that That's still apply? Uh, exactly. FMLA. It's, it's difficult. There's sort of layer upon layer here for sure. So in the regs that the DOL just issued, the potential exemption, um, may you may claim it if an authorized officer, so it could be, you know, an owner or if you're a little bit bigger, um, some other officer of the business determines that by providing this leave, it's going to result in the small businesses expenses and financial obligations exceeding the available business revenues and cause the small business to cease operating at a minimal capacity. The absence of the employee or employees requesting this type of leave would entail a substantial risk to the financial health or operational capabilities of the business because of that employee's specialized skills, knowledge of the business responsibility, or you don't have sufficient workers able, willing, and qualified available to work if you give the paid leave to perform the labor or services that your business provides um, under either you know, the, the paid leave or the expanded FMLA, and these labor services are needed for you to continue basically to operate. So if you want to try to take advantage um, of this potential exemption, um, there was a lot of confusion about well, what do I do? Do I have to apply to the Department of Labor? No, you don't have to apply, but what you do need to do is document, right, and keep in your own files in case the Department of Labor comes knocking at your door and says, hey, we have a complaint. Why didn't you provide the paid leave? You are going to need to provide to the Department of Labor, and the U.S. Department of Labor is the enforcement agency for these new laws, your file that says, hey, this is why I'm claiming the exemption that I've met you know, one or more um, of these standards. Okay, next slide. So um, there are, how does this work with other types of paid leave? So the DOL temporary regulations provides that employees can choose or employers can require that they use any other paid leave, vacation, PTO, but not paid sick leave. You can't require that concurrently with the expanded FMLA. Um, what does that mean? It, it could mean either, remember we talked about that there was that first two weeks unpaid. Um, maybe it's gonna be paid because the person qualifies under both expanded FMLA and the, the paid sick leave. Paid sick leave requires the pay. They might be using that first and then go into, um, if it's only for the child care and school closure issues, getting paid for the rest of it. Um, but you, you're gonna have to say like, ah, you know, is there other leave that I have that someone can choose or I may be able to require that they dip into first concurrently with this expanded FMLA. But remember, if you're providing it under your own policy or another law, then these rate caps do not apply. So the rate caps only apply for the paid leave under this new legislation. Also, once you've used available leave, if the person still has FMLA leave left, then you're going to have to provide the paid leave 
Um, again, it's going to be for expanded FMLA under that two-thirds cap. Um, it might be at two-thirds or the full regular rate for paid sick leave after that available leave is used. For paid sick leave, the new paid sick leave, employers are prohibited from requiring their employees to use other paid leave that might be under your policy, could be under state law. Many, many states and localities require their own paid leave, and you can't require them to take any unpaid time before being able to use this paid sick leave. So um, there's a lot to think about and to look at. Um, you sh you're going to need to check, besides your own policies on leave, state and local paid sick leave laws. And if we could go to the next slide, we've listed this is going to be, you know, sort of ever ever changing to a chart that's got some of the other state and local leaves on it. Um, Daniel and I were just talking about that. Just um, I think it was today, maybe last night. I am located right near Washington D.C., and this is just to give you an example. The D.C. Council, which D.C. already has paid sick leave, they just passed a new law that says on top of that, and seemingly on top of this new federal leave, we're now adding special expanded COVID-19 leave for similar reasons. And so it is looking very likely, depending on what laws you're covered by, that you know it's going to get layered on, that you might have to have, you know, pay out this leave, pay out any state leave that might even be currently amended, like I just mentioned. So you're gonna to have to look very carefully, where are you doing business? What's my state and locale doing? And you know, line it up in terms of you know, paid leave, unpaid leave, how much am I gonna actually have to pay out? Leslie, when you say layered on, does that mean that you could actually be paying at the same time an increased amount because you're paying both the federal and the local or state leave at the same time? Probably they're gonna get layered like concurrently is is what is what it looks like. But again, we're looking very closely and we'll need to look very closely at each state law to see is there, and, and we're hoping the DOL comes out with a little more guidance because what they're saying right now is all of this is on top of any other leave that the employee is entitled to. When you say concurrently- but It's a great question. You mean, you mean that they're likely to have a longer period of paid leave as opposed to a yes, higher pay? Yes, issue. well, right, and, and so portions of it could be at that higher pay, right, because right. a lot of states don't have a cap. It's just pay the leave at the you know, employee's regular. So it could be both length of time and for portions of that time, a higher amount. Understood, thank you. Okay, uh, next slide. So just want to talk for a moment about, you know, job protection rules while people are off on this leave. So what we would call sort of the normal FMLA leave protection job rules apply in most cases. And in a nutshell, that basically says, unless you can show that the job was going to be, you know, eliminated anyway, um, when someone comes back from protected leave under the FMLA, you need to give them their job back or some type of equivalent job. Now, there is an exception here for employers with fewer than 25 employees. If the employee's position no longer exists due to economic conditions, other changes in the employer's operations that were caused by this public health crisis during the period that they were off on leave. And if you, you can see, I'm not going to read them out on the slide, um, but even then, you've got to make efforts to try to restore the employee to the same or equivalent position. Um, and, you know, this is something, again, uh, that you're going to need to pay attention to. Some of you, really, for the first time, if you were small enough that you weren't covered previously by FMLA. Okay, next slide. So, um, a little glimmer of light here, and I know you're going to have a separate presentation on paycheck, paycheck protection and small business loans, so I'm not going to get into that. But for the, there is tax relief, so employers who have to provide all of this leave that we're, we were just talking about under um, this particular legislation, this only provides, you know, applies to this leave, not the other state or local leave that you might also provide. But if you are 
um, a business with fewer than 500 employees and you've had to provide any of the leave that we're talking about, that is supposed to be a pass-through basically to the federal government. You're not supposed to actually have to pay for it out of your own pocket. How does it work? Employers are not subject to the employer portion of Social Security withholding taxes, and the employer can use the withheld taxes to fund the employer's payment of this paid leave. Okay, so you don't forward those payments to the IRS. If you don't collect um, as much as is going out in leave, there is um, going to be a process and it's supposed to be expedited to request a accelerated payment from the IRS. And I'm um, not going to get into sort of all the tax issues on that, but it's um, something that the IRS is issuing guidance and, and such, so you'll want to pay attention as that comes out as well. Okay, next. So um, second um, big legislation that came out is the Coronavirus Aid Relief Economic Security Act, or CARES. That was signed into law on March 27th allocates $350 billion to help small businesses try to keep workers employed amidst the current pandemic. Um, I was just hearing today, you all probably heard too, there's the loan portion of that is already being overwhelmed and Congress is talking about pumping more money into that piece of it. Um, we're waiting for more regulations to come out, but for our purposes today, the law includes enhanced unemployment benefits. I mentioned these other programs, which is going to be covered in another um, webinar. Next. So unemployment, this is something that you know you need to know about, your employees may be asking about. This is a really, really big uh, deal. Federal pandemic unemployment compensation is going to provide an additional $600 per week in benefits. So that is in addition to whatever an employee may qualify for under their state, your state's unemployment laws, whatever they get there, federal government is gonna add $600 to that. It's also gonna extend unemployment insurance by 13 weeks. And the $600 kind of enhancement, that's gonna run through July 31st, 2020. Once someone runs out of their traditional state unemployment, there will be federal funds for another 13 weeks. Now, not this additional $600, it appears, but just 13 weeks of whatever they would get and be qualified for under state law. It makes unemployment compensation available also to those traditionally that wouldn't be eligible for regular unemployment, those with a limited work history, even some in some states people have been self-employed, and those that have exhausted or just don't otherwise qualify for their state unemployment comp benefits. It also provides temporary full funding, federal government funding for the first week of unemployment, which is traditionally under state laws, a waiting period. But absolutely, you've got to check applicable state and local actions, including these benefits are available only when states sign an agreement with the federal government, um, basically accepting these funds. So we actually are keeping running charts of states that are doing that. Um, but you always want to check and you know make sure that those benefits are going to be available, mostly to have those discussions with your workers. Okay, next slide. So those are the new sort of paid um, uh, paid leave, paid um, extension of family medical leave, enhanced unemployment benefits. I want to just kind of walk through um, fairly briskly. What else do you as an employer need to be thinking about? So whether it's, you know, people asking questions in the workplace, other employees, maybe customers, you know, who has COVID-19? Am I at risk? Um, who can you give information to? Um, we're going to talk about that um, with ADA and privacy. Just bearing in mind, right, in addition to these other things, you still are covered by the Americans with Disabilities Act. That means you have to give reasonable accommodation with individuals with disabilities unless you can show there's an undue hardship. You can exclude people, employees from the workplace if they are a direct threat to themselves or others. This is where you know testing positive or having symptoms of COVID-19 may come into play for your ability as an employer to ask certain questions and make a decision about whether a worker can and can't be in your workplace. You're not allowed to require medical exams or ask direct medical questions unless they're job-related. 
you're not in the healthcare profession or emergency first responders, so probably not job related for you. Um, the EEOC, that is the agency that mostly governs ADA concerns, has said though that under the current circumstances, even though a medical exam typically includes taking someone's temperature, you could do that um, in this current pandemic. Uh, we always advise being really careful though. You may not have a thermometer that works. It could be that someone you know, took um, Tylenol or something before they came to work and is not showing a fever. So you can ask then about you know, certain symptoms. Um, and this is sort of an exception. Normally you wouldn't ask about that, but you can ask a little bit about, you know, do you have currently a fever? Are you currently experiencing? And but you need to be careful following CDC kind of guidelines about what symptoms you can can ask about. Very importantly, you have to maintain confidentiality of this medical and related information. Um, you may have people who are unwilling to work due to concerns about acquiring the infection. And you have to really be mindful of, you know, is it reasonable? Like is someone just got saying, ah, I don't want to leave my house. And you're like, but wait a minute, we have a job here for you. We're taking reasonable precautions. We're looking at the CDC guidelines and local health guidelines. We're doing all of that. Um, you know, if they're not being reasonable, then you may not have to sort of provide this accommodation or leave. But also you may need to look at if they've declared previously or now that they do have some sort of disability. So if they said, look, I have an underlying kidney condition or a heart condition and they're identifying it, then you know that may come more into play that you're gonna to have to provide an accommodation for them if they don't wanna to come to work. Next slide. Some related privacy um, considerations. Um, people hear about HIPAA and that um, really protects medical information from medical providers, not medical information that businesses may come into, into contact with. But you still, for privacy concerns, can't, again, disclose certain information. So if you have an employee confirmed to have COVID-19, as an employer, you can and should in, inform fellow employees of their possible exposure in the workplace. But you've got to also maintain confidentiality. So you can't say the name of the employee, you can't wink and point to someone. What you can do is let them know, the other employees, that they may have been exposed if they worked in a certain location or during a certain time period when that employee who tested positive was at the workplace. Um, be aware of any differing you know, state obligations. Again, um, be wary of any third party um, that might be requesting information. Again, there's there's no like general, hey, because we're in the middle of a pandemic, we can share this information with anyone who asks. So you've got to keep that in mind. Okay, next slide. One of the things many, many businesses, including small businesses, are having to, you know, think really hard about is are we going to have to, you know, lay off employees or furlough them or reduce their hours or reduce their pay? All of those things are potentially available to you. We want to highlight some considerations. If you've got exempt employees, that means exempt under the Fair Labor Standards Act from overtime. If they've worked um, even some hours of a work week and then you've decided, ah, uh, you know, I've got to send them home because I don't have enough work, generally you have to pay them for the whole work week. Um, if it's a non-exempt employee, unless there are state laws that say, you know, there's a minimum hours requirement, as soon as you send that, that non-exempt employee home from work, typically you do not have to pay them any longer. You can reduce the hours of your employees. You can reduce their pay, but make sure you're not doing it below the minimum salary requirements or minimum wage requirements um, or any, you know, local prevailing wages or, you know, state or local minimum wage requirements as well. Um, keep in mind, now some of you may have work situations where you can allow employees to work remotely and that you're allowing your non-exempt employees who typically don't work remotely, but you're going to let them do this because you want to keep them employed and they can work from home. They have to be paid for all hours worked. So you want to pretend basically, even though they're working remotely, that it's just like a regular work day or make a flexible schedule for their hours, right? So maybe they have to care for kids, but they don't qualify for the paid leave that we talked about. 
So instead of, you know, eight to four, maybe they're going to work, you know, for a few hours, then take a break to care for their kids, then work later hours. You want to keep an eye on it. You want to make sure that you're recording all of their time and really keep a tight eye. What you don't want is to have unexpected overtime at a time when you're trying to, you know, reduce your payroll costs. So employees may say, I want to help the company. I'm gung ho. I'll work day and night. Ah, you know, maybe you want that, but keep in mind, you have to pay them for every hour worked, including any overtime. Be well, also aware of any expenses. So, you know, suddenly they're using their printer, reams of paper, things like that. Those are typically business expenses. So you probably are going to need to reimburse them. Yeah. Well, I think we're seeing that a lot with small businesses is that it's a challenge to obey these wage and hour laws and make sure that breaks are taken and everything, even in the best of circumstances. And now you have a lot of non-exempt employees working from home. It's even a, a greater challenge to make sure that the record keeping is tight and that everyone's getting paid for every hour work. So it's a very good. Absolutely. Very Absolutely. And again, you know, for a lot of you, you're going to need to give that a lot more thought than you would in the workplace, again, because they are working remotely. Um, and again, you know, we always say, you know, beware the enthusiastic employees like, oh, oh, don't worry, I'm not gonna record these hours, I just wanna help or I'm volunteering my time. You can't let them do that. So good, good point, Daniel. Okay, next slide. The other thing that, you know, you need to be thinking about is, is benefits, right? Um, certainly for any of the leave that we talked about, that paid leave or expanded FMLA leave, you as an employer must continue to provide, you know, healthcare coverage under the same terms of conditions as if they didn't pay, as if they didn't take leave. So if you've got a copay, most employers do, you can still require your employees to pay that copay, but you do need to keep them covered. Now, if you're talking about furlough, you know, which is typically a temporary layoff, then um, and your and the actual layoff. And even if you reduce hours so that maybe you're taking someone down who did qualify for your health plan and now they don't, you need to examine the terms of your own group health plan to determine whether any of those instances trigger a loss of coverage and then entitlement to um, continued health coverage under COBRA, okay? So make sure if it triggers COBRA, that means, you know, when someone you're not going to continue coverage for them. You're not going to continue paying for it. Under COBRA, though, the employees are allowed, generally speaking, to pay for the coverage themselves. And you want to make sure that those notices get out. Also, you've got to make a determination if you're, you know, kind of separating employment um, for any length of time, whether any accrued holiday, vacation pay, sick pay, other PTO is due to be paid out to the employees. And that really is going to be governed by your state and local laws and your own policies as to what needs to get paid out. Okay, next. Um, we, Daniel and I were talking about, do we even talk about the National Labor Relations Act, which normally applies to unionized um, members only. But I wanted to highlight just a couple of things because the last thing you need is you know, an NLRA issue coming your way. Um, there is coverage, certain protection, even if you don't have union, um, you don't have a collective bargaining agreement, your employees aren't unionized. And that can be for employees who collectively complain about the terms and conditions of employment, including safety issues at work, right? So we're in the midst of you know, a, a very scary um, pandemic right now. It's possible you know, people, your employees may get together and say, we're worried about this. We don't think that you're protecting us. We're going to walk out, but you still have to pay us, things like that. They may be engaging in what's called protective activity and be able to you know, make a claim with what's called the National Labor Relations Board. Um, refusing to work because of safety considerations may be considered protective activity. It's a pretty high bar. They'd really have to show that you weren't protecting them by being able to do social distancing, you know, wear masks if appropriate. Um, but we just wanted you to be aware of that as well. Next slide. And I think last for right now, um, there's something called the WARN Act. Um, that um, applies typically to um, larger employers. Yeah, Leslie, I think we could put a pin in this. Uh, this okay. one. Okay. Absolutely, any it's there if you need it, that. right? If you're if you're the size. Um, yeah. So, getting to a few of the practical problems and sort of wrapping up some of the things that we've talked about. Um, 
the for if you have employees who test positive you're going to find out typically either the employee tells you or you may be contacted by a local authority don't allow them to come back to work until medical clearance you're allowed to do that that they need to get something from a medical provider saying you know come back to work and then it's safe to come back to work at that time after the recommended you know isolation quarantine period and we already talked about the need to notify um, employees who may have been exposed. Um, they, you know, refer to CDC guidance. You know, none of us here are healthcare providers. We're not going to pretend to be experts, but you should refer them. Um, they may, may or may not be entitled to the type of the leave that we've talked about. Um, you may be faced with, you know, customers or vendors who come and announce that they're positive. Um, or asking about your employees. We talked about that a little bit. You can say whether there's been an exposure. Um, if someone is coming to you and says, you know, someone who's interacted with your business may have been exposed. Again, you can't ask for the name of it, but you can ask, well, what period of time and what location were they in to then take in that information for yourself and provide that information to your employees. Um, we talked a little bit about um, being mindful, though, stay at home orders. Daniel mentioned, you know, some of your businesses may be essential businesses, some may not. That's very much dictated. Um, at the state or local level, but you know employees can be very confused about this. You know, what does it mean if I if it's stay at home? Does that mean literally I have to stay at home and you have to pay me? So you need to be prepared based on you know information that we've provided today, other information that you're getting to answer those questions. Um, take universal precautions. Again, those are CDC and local health. But you know. I didn't mention this, but OSHA, right? Another Department of Labor that um, has to do with health and safety and local um, health and safety agencies are gonna be looking at you as an employer potentially to say, are you, if your business is open, doing what you need to do to protect people? So be mindful, right? Not just outside the home or when you're grocery shopping or doing something yourself, but thinking about your own business and are you taking the recommended precautions? And kind of last, um, you know, everyone is dealing with a lot of fear right now about their own health, the health of their loved ones. If I go to work, who am I exposing with this? And job security, you know, what am I losing my job? Where's my paycheck coming from? Um, you know, communication is key. It's difficult, but we really encourage you with what you know right now to kind of get a jump on it. <clears throat> you know, try to interact with employees as often as possible. And, you know, it's okay to let them know what you don't know. You know, I mean, all of us are kind of in this together. So share the information that you do know. Let them know that you're keeping on top of things. Let them know that, you know, as soon as the health situation or economic situation changes, you'll be back in touch as soon as possible. Thanks, Leslie. I want to leave some time here for a few questions. We've had a few questions posted on the side. Uh, the first one, I heard there's an exemption for FMLA. Do you know how to go about filing for that? I assume the, the questioner is asking regarding uh, uh, under under 50 employees or um, or uh, or unless you talk about traditional FMLA, in which case uh, could be the one year program. I'll let you uh, answer that. Right. The exemption would be just for this, you know, expanded emergency FMLA leave. And so, again, at first we thought, because the way the, the law was written itself, it said that the Department of Labor was going to kind of address that in its regulations. And we didn't know, like, we're going to have to file and wait to get approval. How is this going to work? So what we've done is put in the slides and then I know you've got resources. Um, we've got a good COVID resource on our Jackson Lewis site that will also link you into the Department of Labor. But we've put in the slides here, you know, how might you qualify for an exemption? And the good news is you don't have to file something. In fact, they don't want it at the DOL, but you need to, you know, kind of be honest with yourself and say, I'm running through this criteria. If you think you meet it, keep it documented in your file and you won't have to provide that expanded FMLA or that paid sick leave that is simply for um, because the child school closed or the child care provider was unavailable. Um, next question is, how would these payments uh, affect employees who are laid off and collecting unemployment? So what he's asking is, um, if, a, if an employee has been laid off, 
do you are you required to pay anything under the Paid Leave Act? Right, that's a great question. So the answer is no. If if you have already laid off um, an employee or furloughed them, then these paid leave benefits don't come into play. Now the assumption is, and so I'll, let me just say this: the assumption is you didn't have work for them, right? Your your business site closed entirely, or because of the economic conditions, there's almost nobody there. Um, that's happening to a lot of businesses, and so you know for those reasons and those alone. You furloughed them, you laid them off, they're now going to be entitled to these unemployment. The one thing that we're saying, keep an eye on this, would be if I had mentioned that letter from Congress going, hey, wait a minute, we're, we're concerned that an employer might, now that people are entitled to leave, just say, I don't want to give you that leave, I'm just going to fire you. Under those circumstances, you know, now that this paid leave is in effect, what we would say right now is just, be able to document, right, the reason for why this person was furloughed. Now, if they're already furloughed or laid off, don't worry about it. Um, this, this, these new requirements came on board April 1. So anybody before April 1, don't worry about. But even if you furloughed or laid off after April 1, we think if you can just document the reason why, not someone asked for leave, you should be okay. But that's a great question. Great, and then how is the interaction with any of these leave laws with uh, short-term or long-term disability? If at so, all. So um, on that, um, this is gonna sound like I'm punting the question. Um, again, when we talked about layers though, you would really have to look at your own plans, your own disability plans. And I would say, you know, talk to whoever your broker or provider is and review your own plan to see how this may like layer in. Um, so I can't really kind of, there's no sort of one size fits all answer to that, but it's absolutely, it's a good point, something that you need to take a look at. It, also, it is true too, if you get unemployment, and this goes back to the other question, it's very clear between this, on the unemployment law that we talked about, that if you were to get paid leave for some portion you know, so let's say someone's on leave and they applied early for unemployment, you know, unemployment's going to stop start only after the paid leave kind of goes out. Right. And this is, I think Leslie makes an excellent point that you should always check with your benefits plan as you're going through some of this because Absolutely. for example, you wanted to pay your employee, but they're not working. Sometimes the benefits plan does not allow you to extend health insurance unless that employee is in fact working. So if you're paying a retention payment or something of that nature, uh, you want to make sure you're not in violation of your plan. You may have to offer them COBRA in that case or, or some other. So um, it's always good to check with your individual um, plan. Um, I think, uh, are there any more questions? There's a questions pane on the side here that, um, I uh, so that I think I've addressed all of them, but if anyone has any others, you can answer it, ask it there. Um, Lovely. I, I, I just want to ask as a, as a threshold matter, um, people are only going to have to deal with these paid sick leave issues if someone cannot show up for work either because they're sick or they're taking care of a sick loved one or, or something of that nature, correct? Like for the for, for a lot of companies, do you think for a lot of companies this is, these issues are going to come up at all? Um, I think they will. Yeah. I mean, because, but it, it really is going to depend on the business, right? So there are a lot of businesses that are still like doing okay, right? Relatively okay. They haven't had to do a lot of furloughs or layoffs. They're still operating um, because they're providing something, you know, especially if it's an essential service, right? And so they may well have people coming and asking for this kind of leave because they are, in, you know, they're, they're operating, right? right? And even if you're operating a diminished employee capacity, you're still operating, right? And it's fewer than 500. So you could have laid off five people, but you still have 15. Now those 15 that are still there may apply for the paid leave right. or, you know, the expanded um, family medical leave for, for those reasons. However, um, one, one really important thing, and there's a lot of info in these regs, the DOL regs, if there is any way that your folks can telework, then that's still considered coming to work, right? So 
It depends on your business. It depends on what they're doing. Right. So absolutely. You know, if someone says, I can't literally come into work, but you're like, oh, well, you can telework. And even it's very interesting. Some of the regs now and Q's and A's like that, you know, let, talk a little bit more about telework where you're caring for your young children. Like, let's say you're the only employee, like you're a single head of household, the kids are home and you're like, I would love to work. I can work remotely, but oh my gosh, I have no one to care for my kids. How am right. I going to get my work done? They're encouraging folks to have very flexible schedules. So maybe you work out with your employee, like we get that, but you know, the kids are watching videos or doing nap time, you know, and you can work together to try to carve out a work day and avoid, if you can, needing to trigger these paid leave requirements. So absolutely, you as the employer want to say, how can we be flexible? Right. Excellent. Well, thank you very much, Liz. It has been invaluable for our members. Like I said, this um, a webinar is going to be uploaded to our website and made available. Uh, I've put some links on the side uh, for our coronavirus uh, um, resources and for tomorrow's webinar on PPP and small business loans. Uh, thank you all again for attending. Appreciate it. Thanks, everyone. Um.